Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and welcome to this uh, video on ecology. It's an introductory screencast on some of the basic principles of ecology, and I'm going to walk you through some of the important issues, like for example, the hierarchy within the study of ecology, and just sort of a general outline of what you can expect while you're studying ecology. So let's, let's jump right into this discussion if we can. So let's go down here, make that a little bit larger. So the word ecology itself, I, I find very interesting. It's, you know, ology is the study of, as you know, but eco is, comes from a Greek word meaning uh, home. So it's the study of our home. And this is a beautiful picture here in Yosemite National Park in California of Mirror Lake. And it's a wonderful lake, but what's interesting is that it's becoming more and more shallow over time and sediment uh, creeks that are bringing the water into this lake are also bringing in sediments. And so the lake is becoming more and more shallow. And as it turns out that over time, this lake is, will be no longer. It'll eventually uh, become so shallow, it'll be marshy, and then it'll become like a meadow. And then eventually grasses and small shrubs will grow, and then some trees. And it'll pretty much take on the appearance of what you see in the background right here. And so that's a concept called ecological succession, which means there's going to be a transition over time of certain populations uh, replacing others. And so that's a complex concept, but we'll be looking at it. It involves both like competition, which is a biotic factor, and it also involves some abiotic factors. In other words, like nutrient quality will increase over time, which will facilitate the arrival of more advanced organisms like trees. And so, um, ecology, to define it, would be the interaction between organisms and their environment. And I, I know that that is clear, but it doesn't really speak to the, the coldness that is ecology. And it's so important. It's this interconnectedness that all living things are bound to one another. And whatever one organism is doing, it, other organisms need to respond to it. Likewise, organisms respond to the outside physical, non-living components of, of the world as well. And so there's this beautiful interaction between organisms and their environment. So let's, let's pursue this. And so to summarize it, this is just big picture ideas. You know, biotic or living interactions and A is not, so abiotic factors. But both of these are really critical. And so, like, you know, can you name these? Like, for example, if you're studying a river, like, for example, this wonderful T Tuolumne River, some of the physical or abiotic factors that you might want to consider that organisms that live in the river <laughs> really need to, to be tolerant to, which is temperature. Um, you could look at the amount of light that is penetrating the river. You could look at the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the water. And what are the factors that are affecting that? Like, for example, wind is something that's important because the wind is delivering oxygen to the water, whether or not it's running over rocks or, um, in order to, to increase the amount of oxygen. You could look at pH. So these are the physical factors that will determine what organisms are capable of living in there. And then there's like the, the biotic would be what? Like what interactions? In other words, like who's eating who? In other words, predator-prey relationships. You could be looking at symbiotic relationships between organisms in, in the river. Or you could be looking at competitive uh, issues between organisms. And so ecology is, a, is considering all of these things. It's considering the interaction between organisms in the non-living and the living. And so the abiotic factors, again, are the, the non-living things, sort of the chemicals, the amount of oxygen, the amount of nitrogen in the water, the amount of phosphate in the water it could be temperature, it could be light or, or the absence of light, darkness. It could be, uh, the, again, the nutrient quality of the water. It doesn't have to be just water. It could be looking at the same thing on, on the side up here as well. It could be looking at soil. And even up here in the forest, something like, for example, a fire could be an abiotic factor as well, which is uh, organisms need to be able to respond to that. So it's the interaction between organisms, which is the biotic one, and their environment, which is the abiotic one. So it's kind of a cycle. And so 
these abiotic factors are really important. And I, I can't think of a better example than how abiotic factors will influence whether or not a population can survive or even live in a particular area. Like you might be familiar with the California coastal redwood tree. And the, the, the coastal redwood tree, it's very tall. It's the tallest living thing on, on the earth. And it requires a tremendous amount of water. But if, if you're familiar with the temperature and rainfall of California, it doesn't really rain so much. And so it's incumbent upon the redwood tree to get a lot of its water from fog. And so fog is something that's not living. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's water. And so what, what happens is that the temperature is an abiotic factor. And so water is an abiotic factor. And so the, the trees can only tolerate uh, so much heat and they can only tolerate so much lack of water. So they're sort of uh, needing to live in a particular area. So that is something called distribution. Like, where, where is the range of the California redwood? And so, you know, some organisms uh, prefer salt water and fresh water. So these are abiotic factors as well. So if you look at this map of California, you can see that they're hugging along the coast right here. So this is about a, a what would you say, about 500-mile range. Let me go back to that. But not more than maybe 30 to 40 miles inland at that. And so fog is a very important abiotic factor that's helping the redwoods uh, survive. So that's critical. And so I have to say, in addition to, uh, to, to temperature and water, I would have to say that light is, is critical. Um, you might not consider it because we live on the land and there's plen plentiful amount of light uh, most of the time. Although if you're living in a forest, uh, sometimes the canopy of the forest can really absorb a lot of the light. So if you're living on the forest floor, light is a factor. You have to be shade tolerant or at least struggle in order to get through that. One way to do it, if you're living in a really dense forest like a jungle, like in the rainforest, you could sort of deal with the lack of sunlight by growing very quickly so that you can get up to the top so you can get plenty of sunlight. But in the water, the water is a real interesting thing because the light won't penetrate very far into the water. And light is one of the main sources of energy uh, that organisms that photosynthesize, as you may already know, gather their energy from the sun. And so therefore, they need to be able to have plentiful amounts of sunlight in order to photosynthesize to provide food for the rest of the food chain. And so I say most of ecosystems are driven by this because at the very bottom of the ocean, we have these thermal vents that can gem generate a tremendous amount of heat and also release some chemicals, some sulfur compounds that there are certain bacteria that can actually use those compounds to produce energy. They're called chemoautotrophs. And so those are the, the basis of the food chain down in those really obscure and random um, deep ocean environments. But most of the time we're talking about sunlight as the source of energy that's driving the ecosystem. And that could be limiting. And that's an abiotic factor in the water. I mentioned wind. Uh, if it's really too windy, that could possibly topple over organisms, especially if they're growing really tall. So redwood trees get around this. They're capable of being knocked over by the wind, but they get around this because they have root systems that intertwine under the soil, so they support each other. For the strength of the, the tree is the forest indeed. But in the, in the water, again, the wind can actually stir up uh, and and cause uh, turbulence in the water, which is which is great. It introduces a lot of oxygen to the water, especially where the where the ocean meets the land, the intertidal zone. There's a lot of wave action that brings in and crashes over rocks, which aerates the water. Sort of like if you think of your aquarium, an aerator is adding oxygen to the water. And so the organisms that live along the intertidal zone and the tide pools really benefit from that introduction of of wind and oxygen. Uh, and so that's an important abiotic factor, wind. And of course, soil. If, if the soil is pitiful, it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it, doesn't have a lot of phosphorus or magnesium or potassium, these are crucial elements that plants need. Obviously, it's not going to be a very good place to grow. And likewise, the soil, not to get too far with soil, but it, it soil is a combination of sand and, and um, 
other components, organic components, like broken down organisms. But if there's too much sand, uh, you know, you might know just from um, your basic observation that not a lot of plants can grow in the, in the desert uh, for a variety of reasons. But the sand even on the beach, it, sand doesn't hold water really well. And so the water just simply percolates through. And so uh, that will affect the distribution of organisms there, plants that can live there and therefore animals that eat them. And so that's important. And then periodic disturbances is another example of abiotic factor. Some organisms really require uh, a periodic disturbance like fire. For example, like trees, sequoia trees in particular. You might have picked up that I like the sequoia. Uh, fire is necessary for them to reproduce. It clears out competitive veg vegetation and it allows the young saplings to be able to grow and it also the heat allows the seeds to be dislodged from the trees. But just a periodic disturbance of intermediate level is good for the community in general. It sort of like cleans it out, it reduces pro possibly invasive species that are not tolerant to these kinds of disturbances and it allows for greater species diversity, periodic disturbances. Now, if the, if the disturbance is really minor, it's not going to be able to do much. And if it's huge, like for example, a massive fire, it may take everybody out. Or if it's a massive tsunami, that, that would not be so good. That would like really reduce diversity. But periodic disturbances, for the most part, intermediate are very good for the community. And so, uh, you know, this picture, in, in addition to it being rather beautiful, is something called a vernal pool. And what's interesting about this is you might think, well, why are, the, why are these yellow flowers growing in this particular area and not growing back up here? I'm like, I don't know, it could be random. But it's not. There's a reason for this. And it's like, well, maybe the, this particular species of flower requires more water. And you're like, well, I don't understand this because it probably rains just as much over here as over here. I'm not really figuring this out too much. And so as it turns out, this is a more moist of an area, and the reason is kind of obscure. I'm not sure if you would have picked it up, but right below the soil, there's kind of this hard pan where the water accumulates, and therefore it stays more moist, and it facilitates flowers from growing in here. And so just to point that the distribution of this species being over here versus over here has to do with the abiotic factor of higher moisture in the soil. And so when you study ecology, there's these different levels. I mentioned this at the very beginning of the, of the video, this hierarchy. And so it sort of builds one upon another. And what's interesting about a hierarchy is that it's just not stacking one layer to the next, is that there's emerging properties that come out of each level of organization. And so ecology is such a huge topic, it needs to be studied at each step, but ultimately all of it needs to be integrated. So the, so the very beginning step of this is the organism. Like for example, here's the uh, giant sequoia tree. And so it ranges from uh, studying individuals, like for example, the physiology of the tree or the morphology, the structure of, of, of this and how it's adapted to its particular environment, meaning what phenotypic traits does it have that enable it to survive in this particular area. Uh, do that. And so sometimes you know, when you're looking at behavior, it's a little weird to think of plants as having behavior. Normally we think of animals. And so you could study animal behavior uh, in, the, in the subject of ecology. You could do that. You could look at how organisms are learning or, or how they're, they're behaving, how they're acting in response to the particular environment. And so when you take it up to the next level, so the first level was organism, single organism. The next level up is a group of organisms, like in other words, a group of these sequoia trees. And so it's a group of organisms of the, of the same species living in a particular area. Like I could say that there's a population of sequoia trees living in a particular grove in Yosemite National Park. I could say it's the uh, Mariposa Grove. And I could study that population. But there's another population of sequoia trees living in Sequoia National Park. Or there's another population living in the Tuolumne Grove or the Merced Grove. So these are 
groups of organisms, and things that you'd want to study here is the number of organisms in the population, or is the number increasing or decreasing, and what are the factors that are affecting that. And there's a whole chapter that we'll be looking at in ecology just studying population dynamics, which mainly has to do with growth. But it also could be like the pattern of distribution and what's happening in the population uh, and, and counting the number of organisms. And so population, very important. So it examines things having to do with a group of organisms in a, in a particular species, population. And then there's the community. In other words, the community is not just the sequoia trees, but it's also considering the ferns and it's considering the, the uh, incense cedar trees, it's considering the Douglas uh, fir, it's considering uh, squirrels, it's considering the beetles, it's considering the ants, it's considering all of the populations living in a particular area. And when you consider more than one population, what you're talking about is the biotic interactions. So in other words, what's the squirrel's relationship with the tree? What's the bird's relationship with the tree? Is it symbiotic? Is, is there any predation going on? Maybe there's competition for sunlight between the sequoia tree and the, and the grass. So all of those are community interactions. Those are mainly biotic interactions between organisms. And so we'll look at that. There's an entire chapter devoted to that study. Community ecology is very interesting. And then, of course, like here's an example of that. Like the uh, chicory, uh, as it's commonly called, or Douglas squirrel, it's also a common name, is interesting. It, it, it really lives in the community with the sequoia tree. And what it does is that it comes along and it eats. Do you see here? These are sequoia cones. These are the female cones. And see, this one's kind of green down here. It's a little fleshy. And so the, the squirrel loves to eat that. And so it eats that and gets lots of you know, food from this or nutrient. But the seeds from the sequoia tree are very thin and small, and they don't really have a lot of nutritional value. They're sort of like, they look like um, oatmeal a little bit. And so, but as a result of the the squirrel eating these, what it does is it dislodges those seeds and then it helps to disperse and ultimately helps the tree to reproduce. And so, how do you like this? Such a giant tree and it's somewhat reliant upon the little tiny squirrel for helping it out. So that's a great example of community interaction. And so an ecosystem is taking it next level up. So you went from organism to population to community and then ecosystem. And so I put this picture in here because it shows, do you notice here that these trees are growing, this grass is growing in this one area? Why do you suppose? Why aren't these trees growing, like say, for example, along the, the side of this mountain? It's a fair question. I don't know that it's random. I would suggest, I don't know, maybe you're thinking this, that perhaps when it rains, the water comes running down. Not only the water runs down, but some of the nutrients, and so that the abiotic conditions are more suitable for trees to grow in this particular area and they wouldn't like it up here. Not enough nutrient, not enough water, maybe too much wind, et cetera, et cetera. So they like it here. And so why, why is this considered to be a discussion of ecosystem? Ecosystem t considers not only the biotic interactions between organisms, competition, symbiosis, and predation, but it also now for the first time considers the non-living components, the amount of water, the amount of nutrient, like nitrogen, in the soil, the, the, the wind element. So it considers the whole big picture, which is ecology, the interaction of organisms and their non-living environment. When we say environment and ecology, we, we generally mean the physical non-living abiotic factors. And so this is a really important. It all comes down to ecosystem. We'll be looking at the important mineral cycles like the critical ones are nitrogen. How, do, how does nitrogen get absorbed? Um, how does phosphorus get inv uh, in, involved in this? What is the carbon cycle? And we'll also consider energy through the ecosystem as well. When light comes in through photosynthesis, how it moves from one trophic level to a next. How energy flows and how chemicals are recycled are big ideas in ecosystems. And then the next level up is taking an, an, a, an important ecosystem in expanding it. Like, for example, if you're thinking um, of a bunch of 
trees that are somewhat scattered in grass. This would be called a savanna. This is, if you recognize this, shrubs on the side of a mountain. This is chaparral. Or you can consider what we like to call biomes, which are these common landscapes of ecosystems that are really prominent. Like in California, we have a forest biome, a coniferous forest. We have a desert down here in Southern California. We have a grassland in the Central Valley. And so these are found both on the land and in the water. We have marine biomes and we have freshwater biomes and we have estuaries. And so one of the most salient characteristics of landscape ecology or biomes is getting this big picture idea. In other words, like when you consider the effects on climate due to increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect, you also need to consider things, and this is what ecologists do that are studying landscape ecology, is that carbon dioxide can be absorbed by the ocean. And so carbon dioxide is increasing in the ocean. And what role does that carbon dioxide play in the ocean? Could it be causing the ocean to become a little bit lower in pH? In other words, it's becoming more acidic. And what's the effect on, for example, over here on the eastern side of Australia, what's the effect on the coral reef to this increased acidity in the ocean? Could it be deleteriously affecting the coral in terms of its uh, ability to absorb calcium? And so one needs to consider the big, broad scale environmental issues also in ecology and take it up a notch. So we look at climate and the effect of, of that on uh, world temperature, currents, uh, coral reef, um, forests, all of that, deforestation, what's the effect <clears throat> of deforestation? And then finally, the largest level of all is the biosphere. Sphere means circle. And what's fascinating about this is, as far as we understand this, is that life is rather thin. <laughs> it's rather fragile in everything we've ever seen and haven't seen. And that's, and I want to emphasize, emphasize the stuff we haven't seen because most of the living things are microscopic. Unless you're looking at bacteria under microscope, you haven't seen 99% of the life on the planet Earth. But it's basically in the upper part of the soil in the top soil of the earth and not too far up in the atmosphere as well. So life is kind of like this thin membrane in the earth, which is rather large. And so it's rather fragile and, it, and it's incumbent upon us to protect it. And so it's the total sum of where all living things are present on the earth. And so again, just to reiterate the ecology, I started off with ecology at the organism level, and I built, all, built it all the way up to the biosphere. But really, the, the truth is, when you're studying biology, it comes down to even more simple things than, than just the organism. Like, for example, you might be familiar with the fact that all the elements, uh, about 100 or so elements, are found on the planet Earth. But of those 100 elements, there's really just a handful that are found, about 25% in living organisms. And even within that 25%, it kind of comes down to about 95% of all living things on the earth are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, or, or something called chomps. You can, you can write that out there. That most of the elements uh, found in living things are this, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And what's fascinating is that uh, when you look at biochemistry, you can see that this carbon can form these chains right in here, and you can have hydrogens coming off of it right here. And then you can have some nitrogen groups, and this happens to be the element magnesium in the center. I don't know if you recognize this sort of larger molecule, which is a collection of elements. This happens to be chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a pigment, which means that it, it picks up frequencies of light. Uh, for example, it gives plants or any photosynthetic organism a green color and that because that's because it absorbs everything but green and so we have even something below which is where the elements make up these biological molecules and chlorophyll is an example of that and there's many examples of biological molecules we can talk about sugars and amino acids and nucleotides but ultimately what's fascinating is that these molecules 
are arranged in these little tiny organs called organelles. And this happens to be a transmission electron micrograph of a chlorophyll, which is which what is where chlorophyll is housed. So this darker region right in here is where chlorophyll is. We'll be studying the chloroplasts in detail later. And organelles are part of a cell. Like here's a picture of a plant cell. Here's a chloroplast, here's a chloroplast, here's a chloroplast. And so if I made those green, I could sort of do this. There's a chloroplast, they're very large organelles. And then this, this guy over here is the nucleus. And here's the central vacuole in a plant cell. And so what we say is that molecules make up these organelles, and these organelles comprise this one basic unit of life, which is the cell. It's the smallest unit of life that we could study. And so organisms, like for example the tree, are made up of many cells. And so we're going to take it up from that. Like if you look at a leaf, for example, this oak, if you look at this right here, you can say that, that a leaf is actually an organ. And an organ, if you broke an organ down, in other words, if you were to cut this in half and look at this under the microscope, it's pretty awesome. You can see that each one of these little guys right here is, are individual cells. Do you notice how all these cells on the top are pretty similar? And these cells right here that are going like this are also very similar. And so groups of cells that are similar in appearance and have a similar functionality are called tissues. So this is a tissue, one layer right here. It's called the upper epidermis. This is also a tissue, a group of cells. It's called the lower epidermis. And all of these cells in the middle here is, a, is yet another tissue. It's called mesophyll tissue. And so tissues are collections of cells that comprise the organ. So you get different tissue types. And the different tissues, you might notice, is a little bit different. Like these ones are all sort of together like a fence. And that's great for, if you will, capturing sunlight from above. Usually the light comes from above, from the sun. But yet below, on the lower part of the leaf, if you were to look, flip the leaf over, you notice here it's kind of like spongy down here. And this is how carbon dioxide enters the leaf from the lower side. Plants need carbon dioxide to produce sugar. So the air is able to circulate in this tissue. And so that's kind of a cool theme that we'll be able to look at how different cells look different and they perform differently and different tissues look different and they perform differently which makes the leaf which is an organ conducive to its function which is capturing uh, carbon dioxide and sun. So that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, and then ultimately uh, these tissues comprise organ systems, the vascular system for example, and then ultimately the systems combine like if you think of a human, you can think of the vascular system or the urinary system or the circulatory system, which is the vascular system, um, or you can look at the respiratory system. All of these reproductive systems, they combine to make up the organism, organ systems and organisms. So now there we are, back to the organism. And so organisms, again, groups of them, populations, and then community, and then ecosystems, and then biomes, and then biosphere. So there you have it. There's our introduction to the study of ecology. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit more about it, and I hope you enjoyed that video, and I hope it, it was informative. Thanks for watching.